Friends, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are God. We thank you that you know us and you care about us and you're interested in what we're doing, that you want to know what's going on for us, that you respond to us, that you listen to us and that you speak to us through your word. Help us now as we spend time in your word to understand you, to understand what it is to be people who know you and are known by you and to understand what it is to live as a part of your family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, earlier this year, I, uh, I read a book. Um, I've read a number of books or listened to a number of books uh, while in lockdown. This year, I read this book uh, called Atomic Habits, uh, which uh, is, is designed to help people to uh, live differently. Uh, it acknowledges the reality that most of what we do throughout our days, weeks and years is out of habit. Uh, what the book acknowledges is that if you want to change your habits, you need to understand yourself well enough to acknowledge what you do, to acknowledge what you want, to acknowledge what's positive and what's negative, to be able to work out, uh, I will do things differently if this is the outcome, but I won't do it if that's the outcome. I want to avoid that. I want to run to that. So you need to have a degree of self-awareness to be able to change what you do habitually so that you can be different. Uh, in we're returning to John's first letter to the churches. It's not written to a particular church. It's written to the Christian church. But John makes clear to his readers at the beginning of the second chapter of his first letter, uh, is, which he's writing, he's writing towards the end of the first century, sort of 70 uh, AD. Uh, and he's writing with a very particular purpose. And he says it's right at the start of the chapter. He's writing that his readers would stop sinning. Let's have a look. My little children. So he, he's writing to the church as a father, as a church father. Uh, he cares for the church. So he calls them his little children. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. So it's important to recognise as we look at this chapter that John is being clear about why he is writing these words. He has a goal in mind, a specific goal, and that specific goal is that people would stop sinning. He specifically wants people to stop sinning. So, and this seems like a good thing to tell Christian people to do, doesn't it? People who he regards as his children, as a father, he cares for them. He knows the destruction that sin brings. And it's worth taking a moment to consider why sin is so destructive and why John jumps to the issue of sin. Because sin, when it entered the world in Genesis chapter uh, 2, Genesis chapter 2, 3, Genesis chapter 3, sorry, uh, 2, Right at the beginning of the Bible, sin entered. God set down one rule to Adam and Eve. That was to not eat from a specific tree. And what did they do? They ate from the specific tree. And the consequences of sin were significant. The consequences of sin was that there would be a break in relationship between God and man. So sin broke the relationship between God and his people, God and his creation, the people he created to rule over the world under him. That relationship was broken. They were taken out of uh, the Garden of Eden, out of paradise, out of the place where they could walk with God in the stillness of the quiet of the day. The, not only the relationship with God broken, it was that relationship with the world was going to be broken. Relationship between husband and man and woman, husband and wife. Relationship between uh, childbirth was going to be hard. So relationships were going to be difficult. Uh, work was going to be hard, whereas before there was work, but it seemed easy. Sin changes everything. Sin is destructive. Sin entered and the relationship between God and man was broken. And so John is writing with a goal that these people who he loves, who he cares for, who are in right relationship with God, should stop sinning so that they would not sin. So how are Christian people to live? How are they to not sin? 
Well, John's going to provide us with some help on that, on how to be different, how to change, how to change their habits. So let's have a look. The second half of verse 1 said, But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus is our advocate. He is the one who stands between us and God to reunite what, has, what sin separated. Jesus is our propitiation. He has paid the price for the sins of the whole world. He has turned away God's anger from us and taken it upon himself and dealt with it. We no longer stand guilty before God, awaiting the consequences of our sin. As Paul writes to the Romans, the wages of sin is death. John writes, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation. He has paid the price. He has paid the wages. He has faced the consequences. Jesus paid the price for the sins of the whole world. Which on the first reading, that Jesus, he's the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You have to wonder, does this mean that everyone is okay with God through Jesus? That everyone is forgiven? no matter what. Everybody is now okay. We, are we back to a relationship in the Garden of Eden? And if we stopped at this point, we might find that. And I'm sure plenty of people have stopped there because it is a great idea, that idea of universalism, that everybody ultimately will be forgiven, is forgiven by God, that everybody will be okay. But let's keep going. Let's keep uh, listening to John, let's keep listening to God and see as he explains what he means. Verse 3. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. By this we know that we have come to know him. We know Jesus, John says, if we keep his commandments. For Jesus' death, it appears, to put you in right relationship with God, you need to know Jesus. We need to, we know that we know him when we follow him, when we keep his commandments, when we do what he says we are to do. John keeps going, verse 4. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. John is saying that for those of us who are in right relationship with God, it matters how we live. That's why John is writing. That's why he wants his readers, his children, Christians who are reading this, to stop sinning. Jesus is standing between us and God, and we need to acknowledge that it means something that Jesus has paid the price for our sins. Jesus has paid the price for the sin that separated us from God. I mean, it's worth taking a moment to consider what it would feel like if you paid a debt for someone that they couldn't afford to pay. And they just ignored you. They didn't even acknowledge your existence. It doesn't sit right, does it? I think John's expectation is that we are saved to be in relationship with God through Jesus and are to live following Jesus. Listen to how he goes further to expand this. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So it matters how we live. It matters that we acknowledge Jesus as Lord and we look to his life for how to live in right relationship with God. So what does it look like following Jesus? What does it look like? Well, let's have a look at verses 7 and 8. Beloved, I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you 
which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The commandment that John is talking about is the one that Jesus has given and provided as a summary for the, the, the Ten Commandments, the old commandments. The commandment is to love. The commandment is to, uh, to well, it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and to love your neighbour as yourself. He talks about following the light about following Jesus. Uh, it's, it's an old statement because though they, the, those ten commandments are found and all the commandments are found in uh, the Old Testament, Jesus summarises them when he's pushed by a Pharisee to say what's the most important. And he summarises it that the commandments are about loving God and they're about loving others. And the ten are fulfilled in those two actions. But they're such broad actions. They take in everything, not just how you treat your mother or father, not just how you treat uh, your neighbour's things. They're, they take in everything and they matter. And sometimes we can hear, well, we've got to love people. We've got to love God and we've got to love people. And we think that's kind of an, well, it's a broad statement and you can kind of make it, maybe you can make it say whatever you want to make yourself feel comfortable. But in verses 9 to 11, we see whoever says he is in the, in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Why, after John having given this uh, kind of broad commandment to love, does he go to the negative? Doesn't it seem a bit, um, a bit negative? You know, he's given this positive thing, saying to everybody, I'll give you a new commandment to love, to follow the light. So why does he go to the negative? Well, because he knows what our habit is and he knows what we're like and he knows that our, our preference is to sin. He's writing with the purpose that we would stop sinning, but he needs to be clear. Whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother isn't in the light. You might say you're in the light, but if your life is filled with hate, if you have hate and you're comfortable with that, you're still living in the darkness. You can't see the light. You don't know the truth. You might have convinced yourself that you're living in the light, but it doesn't make it true. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. When we're in the dark, we can't see anything. We can't see the light. We can't see the truth. We can convince ourselves that things are okay. We can convince ourselves that we can see, but it doesn't make it true. This is what I think John is talking about. John is talking about when we're in the dark, we just don't know. So whether we believe something to be true or not doesn't make it true. John wants us to understand the reality of what it is to be a Christian person. And it means being different from who we were. It means being different from how we used to behave. It is a different life and it requires change. It requires understanding. It requires acknowledgement of the truth, not just our truth or our preference or what we'd like to be the case. John goes on. He uses a series of phrases to remind people who they are and calls out people in particular categories to remember who they are. So in verses 12 to 14, he writes, I'm writing to you little children because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you children because you know the father. I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. 
when John talks to these three these three categories to children to fathers and to young men it, it seems like a very uh, masculine uh, point of view and the words that are used are uh, I think what I think he's saying is he's saying to children when he talks to children he's talking to Christians he's talking to the children of God when he talks to fathers he's talking to the elders older Christians and when he talks to young men he's talking to young Christians uh, and I and I think specifically uh, young age Christians not just new Christians though I think it matters and I think the thing is that all Christians are the children of God all Christians have been brought into God's family. All Christians are able to call God Abba, Father, Daddy. We have that close, intimate relationship. We are his children. Uh, we are heirs. We are co-heirs with Christ. We looked at that last year. And the, the children of God, all Christians should know, your sins are forgiven and you know the Father. The status, your status before, your, before your God before your father that you know is that your sins are forgiven. We never move past that, friends. We never move on from that. As Christian people, we never move on from the status of being forgiven and always having needed Jesus to forgive us. We never move on from that. When he talks to fathers, he's talking to older Christians and he says to them twice, you know him who is from the beginning. And I think in that he's talking about uh, the father, but I think he's also talking about the son who always was. Jesus didn't come into being uh, at the, that very first Christmas. Jesus always was. He always was with the father. And the spirit was there at creation. The father, the son and the spirit were there. Before creation, they were in relationship. Before creation, they were together. And we who are older know him who is from the beginning. And we want to, I want to hark back to the beginning of today's passage where it talked about how you know that you know Jesus. We know him by obeying his commandments. So we who are older Christians, we who are elders, who are leaders, we are able to look back on the way that we have been changed. We are able to look back on the way that God has worked in our lives and made us different people. It's not that we put our faith in that knowledge. We always have our faith in Jesus. We always have our faith in Jesus' death on the cross. But we are able to say, I know who I am because I know what God has done and the way that God has changed me and the way that God has used me and the ways that I've been obedient and the many times I haven't and the ways he's continued to forgive me. And if we know that we need to ask for forgiveness again, we do it. And so John writes to young men, to young Christians, men and women who are the future of the church. He writes as, a, as an old man preparing the church for its future. And he says to them, you have overcome the evil one. You have overcome the evil one, which, of course, they haven't. They haven't overcome the evil one. They haven't defeated Satan, but Jesus has defeated Satan. Jesus has defeated Satan. And that is our status, that we live in a world where Satan still has a voice, but he has no power. So even though, and young Christians, young people have this problem, this issue where Satan loves to draw them away, to look for a way for them to stumble, to look for a way for them to fall. And they need to know, and we need to know that Satan is powerless. Satan doesn't hold the power. He still has the voice. He still has the way to tempt, like the way he tempted Eve, like the way that Adam was tempted. We need to know. The church future of the church needs to know that Satan has been overcome. And we also need to know that the word of God abides in the church. For the church to have a future, I'm not talking about our church. I'm talking about the universal church, which does mean, does also mean our church. But the word of God needs to abide for people to know the truth, 
for the for people to know Jesus, for people to know the propitiation of their sins, they need to know God. They need to know His Word. They need to understand God and what He's like, and they tend to know that through the preaching of His Word, through the speaking of His Word, through the reading of His Word, through getting to know God and getting to know what God is like, and for the church to have a future. The word needs to be the center of it. This is a really, uh, these are really big concepts in this passage. I think it's a great passage. And I think while we said at the start, John is uh, wants us to stop sinning. But I wanted to put a quick summary on it. John is calling on each of us to be who we were saved to be. John is calling on you to be who you were saved to be. John is calling on you to be who Jesus died for you to be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus to die for our sins, to be the propitiation for our sins, to put us right with you. Father, help us to stop sinning. Help us to be who you sent Jesus to save us to be. Amen.